It is our special pleasure to welcome Professor Alison Griffiths and uh, also Professor William Boddy, uh, who will not speak publicly, but who is uh, with us tonight. And um, it's been uh, planned for uh, quite a while. We're very happy that Professor Griffiths could be with us uh, today. And we're also very happy uh, to say that this is a pioneering event when we are also streaming uh, the talk to our Vienna campus. We were told that you hear us, but uh, we can't see you. So I hope you're out there and hear us well and uh, uh, will enjoy this talk as well. I will uh, briefly introduce Professor Griffiths and then uh, pass on the words. Uh, the talk will be followed by the Q&A uh, and discussion session, which unfortunately, again, as I was told, our Vienna campus will not be join, will not be able to join on this occasion. Uh, but we are very happy that, and we hope that there are also students uh, and faculty on the other side, on the Vienna campus, uh, that can enjoy this talk. Um, Professor Griffiths is uh, teaching in uh, Baruch College and also in the doctoral program in theater at the CUNY Graduate Center. She is, as you well know, a recognized scholar of film, media, and visual studies. Uh, her research is uh, interdisciplinary, and uh, we will hear about uh, a dimension of it in today's presentation. Uh, she has received her MA from the University of London and PhD uh, from NYU. And um, her uh, research and uh, publications have been uh, multiple award winners. Uh, Professor Griffiths is uh, the recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, a Mayer Fellowship from the Huntington Library, and a Project Development Grant from the American Council of Foreign Societies. Um, she also received the Felix Cross Award for Outstanding Research by a CUNY junior faculty member and has twice won Baruch College's Presidential Distinguished Scholarship Award. Um, along with teaching and research, Professor Griffiths also served as interim dean of the Weizmann School of Arts and Sciences at Baruch. Uh, but despite the administrative and uh, teaching duties, um, she has uh, published widely and is author of over 35 journal articles in such journals as um, Cinema Journal, Journal of Visual Culture, Screen, Film History, Wide Angle, Continuum, Visual Anthropology Review, Early Popular Visual Culture, and many others. And she also has three fantastic monographs. Uh, one of them is especially close to my heart, Wondrous Difference. Um, all of the uh, books came out with Columbia University Press. Wondrous Difference, Cinema, Anthropology, and Turn of the Century Visual Culture is the full title of the book that came out in 2002. Um, this book received several awards. Uh, 16th Annual uh, Society for Cinema and Media Studies Dissertation Award in 1991. Um, Catherine uh, S. Kovach Award uh, for the best published books, a book in film and media studies in 2003, an honorable mention uh, for the Krasnokraus Moving Image Book Award in 2004. Uh, this book explores early ethnographic and anthropological uh, filmmaking, its entanglement with uh, colonial um, um, exhibitions and uh, colonial way of thinking and representing the other. And uh, there are two other monographs that followed the first book, Shivers Down Your Spine, Cinema Museums and the Immersive View, was published in 2008 that developed new theories of immersive spectatorship, something very uh, relevant, actual, and still um, an exciting and, and uh, quickly uh, developing field. And uh, in 2016, um, another monograph came out with Columbia University Press, Carceral Fantasies, Cinema in Prison in Early 20th Century America, which examined how cinema gained a foothold in American penitentiaries, um, also a widely underexplored um, subject. Um, Professor Griffiths is now working on her first monograph, uh, Nomadic Cinema, a Cultural Geography of the Expedition Film, uh, which is scheduled to come out very soon. Uh, but we are very fortunate to hear uh, some of the parts of this future book. And the title of her uh, talk today is The Exploitation Ethnographic Film and the Medieval Cartographic Imagination, a very interdisciplinary title by definition. So uh, we will hear how cinema can be situated in the long degree, in the long durée um, exploration images, and also we'll get to 
uh, learn about the exploitation ethics, which is something which is, uh, I think, incredibly uh, important up to this very day. So please join me in welcoming Professor Griffin. introduction. I'm really um, delighted and honored to be here to share work that has never been presented before. This is really fresh off the press, literally working through some of the ideas a few days ago. Um, so I'm really delighted to have the chance to share it with you and very much look forward to the Q&A session. Um, so yes, it's the perils and pleasures of doing interdisciplinary work where you uh, tread sometimes boldly uh, or gingerly into other academic fields, um, which can be very rewarding, but also a little bit scary when you're not entirely sure how the ideas will be received. So please, I really encourage you to be very frank um, with some of your feedback. So I will get going. On the face of it, uh, an expedition film is easy to define, constituting a cinematic record of travel motivated by scientific, ethnographic, or geographical research. Its context and goals may be quite modest, undertaken by a lone wolf ethnographer for limited audiences, or more ambitious, organized by a museum of natural history to establish or enhance an existing collection, or loftier still, such as an attempt to reach Mount Everest summit or one of the Earth's poles. An expedition film shares generic, aesthetic, and discursive features with five of its closest relatives. At the, um, ethnographic films, travelogues, scenic safari films, and fictional adventure films, all of which may be exploitational in style. Some of the defining characteristics of these films include, but are not limited to, conveying a sense of geographic and temporal progression via landscape shots and maps, juxtaposing ethnographic vignettes with images of transportation, supplies, and the campsite, and offering moments of ludic excess or brutality um, contrasted with scenes of stasis and banality. Of the five related subgenres of nonfiction films mentioned above, the expedition film is thematically the least coherent, explained perhaps by the fact that in the coupling of the word expedition to the word film, the former carries more scientific and discursive weight than the latter. My goals in this lecture are twofold. First, to parse some of the enduring tropes, contradictions, and enigmas of an expedition film in order to establish some basic ground rules about its reason for being and to allude to transhistorical connections across different modes of exploratory image making. These include, but are not limited to, what I call an anxious optic, not always knowing what to, what to look at, um, to the inscrutability of the moving image, not always knowing what's going on in a shot or an image, and three, the relationship of humans to animals, not always knowable and increasingly fraught in the age of the Anthropocene. My second goal is to bring two exploitation expedition films into conversation with medieval cartographic maps and travel illustrations. Since it behooves us to think of these films as part of a long durée of, image of imagining exploration from at least the Middle Ages. Building upon existing work by Tom Connolly, Juliana Bruno, and Friedberg, Teresa Castro, and others, that has positioned cinema within a logos of cartography, the idea of film creating space for viewers to wander about and act like voyagers, I'm interested in corollaries of mind and navigational connections across several centuries of sightseeing. Rather than label these films exotic, as Eric Schaefer does in his book on exploitation cinema, I prefer to use the words expedition and exploitation for added clarity, since exotic, exotic films can encompass both fiction and nonfiction. To that end, I examine how a geographical imaginary circulates in Gao the Headhunter, and of course, these are you know, horrendously offensive and graphically racist images. But these are the posters um, that promoted the film in the 19, late 20s and into the 30s. Um, so this film started out as Gao the Headhunter. It was comprised of several different footage from several different parts of this expedition, 
reissued as Gao the Killer in 1931 with a voiceover narration, um, circulating as Gao the Terror um, as seen in this 1931 lobby display, and re-released in 1956 as Cannibal Island, this time credited to director William Peck. Salisbury brought along filmmaking duo Marion Sue Cooper, Ernest B. Schoedstack of Chang and King Kong fame to supervise the cinematography and followed the 1907 route to Melanesia undertaken by famous American author Jack London on his yacht, The Snark. If that's not enough, I also examined the 1935 exploitation film Fang and Claw to consider how portal and maps, and these are maps of ports that were used in the Middle Ages to guide um, captains of ships safely to shore, predominantly in the Mediterranean, but also in other parts of the world. And the 1547 Ballad Atlas, so, so to consider how portal maps and the Ballad Atlas offer up an imprimatur for the transformation of space into image in medieval maps and cinema. Working with the idea of choreography, a mode of representing space and place that rejects the empiricism of geography in favor of a more holistic gathering of data, one that fuses the scientific with the impressionistic. I tease out parallels across these modes of representing travel and exotic encounters. Described in the title card as Frank Buck's wild animal collecting expedition in the Asiatic jungles, Fang and Claw is a veritable exegesis on the transformation of space from a natural wilderness into a violent place of entrapment for the animals Buck captured in his nine-month expedition to Malaysia and India. The film reverse engineers the sanitized and always troubling zoological gaze, showing us how animals are procured with the assistance of Sakai people for display in modern American zoos. For the most part, space and expedition films is either something to be conquered, navigated safely, memorialized, or post facto filming reassembled in the editing process, becoming, as Priya Jakama argues in Where Histories Reside, which has just come out this fall from Duke University Press, not only part of cinema's enframed image residing within the time-bound present of the now, but also within a differentially temporalized and past and posed world of an image. I end by briefly, and very briefly, commenting on the methodological stakes involved of bringing expedition films into conversation with other disciplines, especially at historical moments when ideas of the real were much more fluid. Okay, so part one, what is an expedition film? Um, expedition films are intertextual, polyphonous texts, borrowing tropes from related genres, and characterized, as I said earlier, by the shifting, often anxious optic that ranges from the subtle and enlightened to the grotesque and reactionary. While often commissioned to meet the needs of various institutional mandates, they're also made for the same reasons we sometimes shoot video or take snapshots while on vacation. The decision to take up filmmaking during an expedition might be triggered by any number of environmental factors or psychosocial variables, including weather conditions, topography, geopolitics, or a sense of obligation. Beyond monumental landscapes and natural features, determining what to film is sometimes governed as much by serendipity as by science. There's a labile quality to all expedition films, not just those where the tone or mood can change in an instant. Ethnographic knowledge comes to us as a, quote, extract or abstract of the experiences and practices it evokes, end quote part of a network of critical moments that anthropologist Johannes Fabian argues are often folded into the chores of knowledge production. And even films that bridge several of the expedition subgen uh, cinema subgenres, sub such as Chronicles of a British East African Trip that was shot in 1926 by George Eastman of Kodak Renown and on permanent public display at the George Eastman House in Rochester, this film contains many of the standard tropes of the genre including moments of rupture, albeit small and fleeting, such as one of the rickshaw porter's steely stares at the camera in, in chronicles that, at least in my reading, suggests irritation, possibly at the annoyance of pulling white visitors around, possibly at the presence of the camera op operator who's in his way, or possibly at something unrecoverable from the filmic record. 
Another shot of a man twisting his head right and left as he looks anxiously off screen while the men, men standing either side of him stare deadpan at the camera betrays the inscrutability of film, the inadequacy of the image to tell the whole story. In this regard, I'm reminded of Simon Kuhl's argument that power in image making does not simply reside behind the image, but rests on its surface, produced in, received through, and distributed across the photographic event itself. And in a sequence that cuts from men dancing around the body of a water buffalo, George Eastman's donkey, and the wound it sustains from a lion attack, that's the image in the middle, and a rhino charging at the camera, we are reminded of the expedition film's almost constant engagement with images of animals. Images that no longer read as signs of nature's abundance, as film theorist Akira Lippitt argues, but exist in a new economy, a state of what he calls perpetual vanishing, as a result of rapacious hunting, climate change, and habitat destruction, a new reality in the age of the Anthropocene. So just let's take a quick look. This film has no sound, but let me just show you a few seconds of it. Chronicle from the film's title, and it's about nine, ten minutes long, this film, doesn't do justice to the layering of indigenous agency, meaning of the hunt, contemporary reactions to the loss of endangered, spe endangered species, all of which are mobilized in contemporary readings of this film. All right, so moving on to part two. Exploitation films made in the first three decades of the 20th century, and I prefer this term over Eric Schaefer's use of the word exotic, might be understood as wonder documents in similar ways to medieval Mapa Mundi, illustrated world maps, Portland charts, um, and illustrations from 16th century uh, travel writing. Wonder is operationalized in all of these texts as the necessary first step towards knowledge. And inside medieval philosophers, theologians, and creators of exploitation expedition films all seem to have intuitively grasped. A sense of wonder fuels the geographic imaginary, a process medievalist Karen, Caroline Walker Bynum argues is as much cognitive and epistemological as magical. According to Bynum, you could wonder only where you knew that you had failed to understand. Thus, wonder entailed a passionate desire for the science it lacked it was a stimulus and incentive to investigation, end quote. Expressions of wonder often came from the mouths of people who had witnessed certain phenomena, oral, oral reports that were occasionally committed to writing. Procuring objects of wonder, a pastime traditionally reserved for naturalists in the 16th century, broadened to the by the 17th century to become a leisurely pastime for nobles and courtiers. It's no surprise then that the exploitation expedition film leverages notions of wonder, curiosity, and the marvelous that could be traced to early models of collecting, exploration, and natural philosophy. There's an uncanny correspondence between medieval charts, atlases, and expedition films. Both construct what historian Barry Goff calls changing fragments of knowledge. Represented in the case of medieval atlases and maps, as ethnographic vignettes of native peoples and wildlife, evidence of a vibrant geographical imaginary that Suzanne Akbari argues is, quote, not that of a universally accepted truth, but rather a discourse that is continually in the process of being articulated and this creating, as it were, its own truth. Mapamundi fused geographical knowledge with ethnographic, humanistic, and political concerns bringing information about the distant world back to those who could not travel. As Hugh St. Victor explained in 1130, wise men and both lay peoples and those learned in ecclesiastical writing paint the world on wood or on parchment so that they can show images to those who wish to know things that are unknown 
because they cannot present the things themselves. These texts infuse cartography with an exoticism and sensuality that was largely written out of the surface of the map by the 17th century, but arguably returns when photography and film are integrated into survey work and exploration in the mid and late 19th century. Expedition films are also, also exemplify the idea of curiositas in the medieval world. What Christopher Columbus evotic, evotic, evo, evocatively described as this art that inclines those who follow it to desire to know the secrets of the, this world. Historian Edward Peters argues that the operative term in Columbus's quote, the operative terms in Columbus's quote are desire and secrets, emotionally charged words that reoccur in the debates accompanying exploratory travel. The fact that exploration is analogized to an art form by Columbus, explicit recognition of the interlacing of the imagination and the navigational skill entailed in traveling such vast distances, seems to presage wonder, wondrous document making that would come to define the golden age of exp exploration film, expedition film rather, in the first half of the 20th century. The Middle Ages witnessed a great many travelers. As Michael Palencia Roth notes, quote, people went on pilgrimages, fought in holy wars, traveled for the sake of education and knowledge, journeyed for mercantile reasons, end quote. Travel was nasty, brutal, and long. Hardly surprising given the words etymological roots in travail and some variant of the idea of labor. Moreover, since ancient times, travel acquired information has often had a, a sensational and suspect quality a suspicion foreshadowing equally pejorative attitudes towards exploitation film. The desire to learn about distant worlds and peoples nevertheless gained legitimacy during the 13th and 14th century, centuries in classic travel books such as Marco Polo's Travels and the fake travel memoir of Sir John Mandeville were enormously popular and influential. Written around 1370, Mandeville's <coughs> Travels was in constant circulation until the 15th century survives in around 300 manuscripts and was translated into at least 10 languages. According to medievalist Mary B. Campbell, travels might today be, la be labeled a literary hoax, a patchwork of plagiarized works that borrows from several distinct sources, including eyewitness pilgrimage narratives, Alexander the Great romances and their spin-offs, and the mercantile and missionary accounts of India and Cathay. Although the book packages the experience of travel and discovery as Mandeville's first-hand experience. Several aspects of Mandeville's travels resonate with Gao the Headhunter. First, both works leverage what Campbell calls an intertextual verisimilitude to establish their credibility while remaining problematic in terms of their veracity. Second, both works are obsessed with pushing at the boundaries of the human. For example, at one point in Gao, the narrator says that the expedition was interested in discovering whether the indigenous people of the Andaman Islands had tails. And throughout the second half of the film, the islanders are referred to as creatures. Salisbury found the Andaman Islanders' phys physical differences especially fascinating, and his written description of one islander from the expedition book Sea Gypsy would not be out of place in a travel account of the world's human wonders from the Middle Ages. Title cards at the start of Gao claim that what follows represents the first photographic images of these islands, noting less, nothing less than, quote, unbelievable, unbelievable scenes of man-eating headhunters, end quote, and that a telephoto lens was necessary so as to avoid instant death from closer contact. The opening sequence of scenes of Gao introduced us to life on board the yacht Wisdom Three. Shots of young, handsome men dressed in crisp, American men dressed in crisp sailor whites going about their chores. This heavy dose of whiteness normalizes our looking relations as one of them, as these men become our surrogate seers in the film. A long standing trope of cartographic authority, the obligatory map charting Salisbury's route, is also included early on and reappears with each new leg of the journey. The first 20 minutes of Gao replete with what Salisbury described as the, quote, laughter-loving, sensuous Polynesian races of the Marquises Tahiti and Samoa, 
constructs a descending racial hierarchy in which peoples viewed as increasingly more distant to Euro-Americans are gradually introduced throughout the film. Footage of women playing instruments and singing, children dancing, and larger group shots of men and women performing a ceremonial sitting dance establish touristic tropes of a paradise lost, of sexually available women, and of plentiful, delicious food. The optic changes suddenly, however, once the expedition reaches Fiji. Evidence of colonial contact is abundant, and more significantly, we begin to see an emerging obsession with staring at the bodies of people. Shots get increasingly tighter as people pose with rigid shoulders and demeanors for the camera, even rotating 360 degrees to show off the striking haircut. The voyeurism synonymous with ethnographic looking relations abruptly shifts in tone when we cut to a sequence showing locals at work rather than posing for the camera. Shots of house construction, fishing, decorative arts, food preparation culminate in footage of a ceremony with stunning synchronized marching and dancing. Once the expedition arrives on the Andaman Islands, the voice of a narration reverts to the earlier reification. In a three shot of Salisbury posing for the camera between two Andaman men, the familiar historical trope of balance, tall versus short, white versus black, and them versus us, is triggered. Fear of the white man and their enmity for him. These pygmies on the Andaman Islands are man killers. The men are about four feet in height, the women about three feet, eight inches. You can get a comparison there. The man is about five feet eight. This is a full grown man and woman. And when they meet, they shake hands as we do, and the visitor sits on the host's lap. They carry on a conversation that sounds like the shattering of magpies. And they showed us their games. They play blind man's buff and leapfrog. There was a forester located on this island in the interest of the British government. So Gail the Headhunter, um, actually, before I'll say that, um, I think we can trace this ordering principle of balance to Mandeville's travels, uh, which medievalist Susan um, Akbari argues imagines cybersity not, not as a thing of chaos, but rather an equilibrium shaped by heat and cold, dryness and moisture, light and dark, orthodoxy and religious deviance, monstrosity and normalcy. The film marginalizes island people spatially and morally from the rest of the world, not unlike the most monstrous figures peopling the margins of medieval, medieval Mapa Mundi that were most often located in India, Ethiopia, or the Antipodean zone. As Ellie Truitt argues, natural variety was thought by 12th and 13th century natural philosophers to occur more frequently and openly at the periphery than at the center in part because of planetary orientation that conferred potencies on natural objects. Remoteness also served as a corollary for extreme racial othering in the 19th and 20th centuries, a sentiment that has lingered from the Middle Ages. While hybridity in the monstrous often became part of its ontology, combining human and animal or various animals, a marker of its non-mimetic representational form, paradoxically, the classic question of whether the monstrous races were human or capable of salvation was never raised, since their indigenous and religious practices appeared to be perfectly satisfactory. Moreover, the idea that there were hybrid people in the world in the Middle Ages was simply a given, and they lived on the edges of the world. Since the further one moves from the center point of Jerusalem, the more deformed and alien things became. Columbus, it might be added, reported he had found neither monsters nor had any report of any, although he did refer to an instance of anthropophagy. Um, the term cannibalism originated with the discovery of the New World, and that's what the term, I mean, that's the term for it, in the Caribbean during his second voyage, and captured men were transported back to Spain, um, where they entered uh, European discourse as living facts, not as a story about faraway people. So the imagination, however, has played a clear a key role in stoking the fire of the marvelous, which resided in the depths of people's consciousness, but surfaced in fireside stories and the gargoyles of medieval churches. Not surprisingly, there are tensions between Gothic headhunters' visual track and narration, as well as with the related written accounts published in articles in Asia Magazine and um, the book The Sea Gypsy that he co-authored of the expedition. Hyperbole is in tall order throughout the film's narration, 
Salisbury was interested in foregrounding the headhunting practices of the islanders, but since nothing we have shown visually corroborates the practices of cannibalism, um, he stages a reenactment. Um, the narration and inner titles are forced to do the heavy lifting in the absence of authenticating visuals. A producer's note in the title card about censoring the repugnant native feast fans our curiosity. Although the painted faces, dancing bodies, and the narrator's reference to a frenzied spectacle with repulsive and obsessed obscene actions over images of pigs running around with ropes dangling from their necks still falls short of depictions of cannibalism, although it certainly hints at zoophilia. Um, tropes of the horror film hover in the background here, as when we consider the etymological meaning of the word territory, which according to Karen Piper, derives from the 15th century French terreur, or to frighten, terrorize, and territory, or frightener, terrorist. The film offers a perfect storm of exploitation ingredients. Headhunting, the threat of death from intertribal tension among Melanesian tribes, white outsiders intruding into communal life, and female islanders reified as exotic man-bait. Schaefer's argument that the film's release within the Depression era fanned the flames of racism along several different axes, socioeconomic, psychosexual, fears of miscegenation, and even Western capitalism, reminds us of the framing effect of geopolitics and ideology upon the film's reception. If viewer imagination then has to fill in the absent depictions of cannibalism in Gao, a shot with what looks like a fake arm and skull burning in a fire is about the sum of it. It's certainly rendered with graphic detail in jo um, Johann Philipp Abelin's 1655 New Welt und Amerikanisch, first published by Theodore de Bry, suggesting that the des desire to visualize the most taboo of human activities has lurked in the corners of the geographical imagination for considerable time. An image from a later version of the book that condensed illustrations from several volumes represented cannibalism as a grand guignol barbecue, replete with women licking their fingers and men ripping off hunks of meat with their teeth. Little is left to the imagination, and the depiction of a bearded man throwing up his hands in horror serves as a surrogate for the European spectator. The scene is in stark contrast to depiction of the um, Andaman Islander life in Gao, where ethnographic information is submitted to a regime of censorship and abstention that Fabian argues makes ethno ethnographic research appear more scientific. Given that much of the information about wildlife and cultural practices in Nouvelle und de Mercaniche was inaccurate, some of the animals depicted are more mythological than real, the geographical imaginary played a crucial role in activating and sustaining the dispositif of cannibalism. Gao tells us two important things about the geographical imagination in exploitation films. First, that ethnographic knowledge is in tension with explanations of cultural difference that evoke an, evoke an age old fascination with the wondrous, the monstrous, and human difference. And second, that there's a reversal of the logic of the 16th century cabinet of curiosities trajectory in which objects of lore, once they are deposited in a collection, take on the quality of science. On the first point, it becomes increasingly obvious while viewing Gao that the exploitation expedition film cannot sustain extreme levels of hysterical fear-mongering and racism throughout the film. It has to take a break in order to avoid drifting into the realm of pastiche making us question whether we trust anything we see or are being taken for a ride. For example, when the expedition arrives in Port Moresby in, in Papua New Guinea, we see stunning footage of the crab claw grass cloth sails on catamarans, which over the course of months are woven by the women. The camera lingers on the surreal shapes that begin to fill, fill the frame, the narrator simultaneously marveling at the uniqueness of the design and material while pointing out the susceptibility to breakage and mold if in contact with water. Wait for months for the wind to blow from the right direction to bring them home. So you can see the schedule of a traveling man in New Guinea is rather uncertain. I doubt very much if you'll ever see another picture of these crab claw grass cloth sails. They're called crab claw sails on account of the shape, and they're made of grass cloth woven by the women. It takes the women months to make one of these sails. It was the only material they had for sail making prior to the arrival of the trader. 
when he brought cotton duck and he had very little sales resistance to overcome to get the natives to substitute the cotton duck for the grass claw that also released the women from sale making to the gathering of ivory nuts and other things for which the traders were willing to give trade goods so he goes on for quite a while describing these sales um, so with regards to my second point about the reversal of epistemological logic, I contend that the exploitation narration, in other words, just the voiceover narration in Gao, transforms some of the native islanders into objects of lore, rather than recognizing their humanity. Although this does not mean that the film's value as an ethnographic record cannot be recuperated. As Australian archaeologist Matthew Spriggs does in an audio essay in the bonus features of the Blu-ray re-release of Gao the Headhunter. The optics and politics of colonial objectification, objectification versus indigenous agency resignified through contemporary reframe, reframing is complex, to say the least. For example, when a group of Andaman men are invited on board the expedition yacht and are instructed to turn in circles, we are reminded of physical anthropology's um, brutalizing legacy of measuring and photographing indigenous people in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Although, and I'm going to show you a clip of this in a minute, although their return gaze and relaxed demeanor gives the impression of them playing along with Salisbury's demands. And when we cut to a shot of the men looking at photographs of themselves taken by filmmaker Martin Johnson during a previous expedition that were published in Asia magazine, there's both an echo of the racist optics of the earlier anthropometric gaze, in other words, them being photographed um, in profile and turning around, um, as the men reflexively look at themselves as images, and a complication of that very same objectification, since the admixture of pleasure, surprise, and possibly pride at seeing themselves complicates simplistic, one-dimensional readings. Oh. Oops. Both put into this bay, and Captain Salisbury held a reception aboard. Captain Salisbury is the man with the shirt. <laughs> These cannibals came out to the missionary boat to listen to the organ. They call it the Sing Sing Bacchus. They can't say box, they say Bacchus. Now these being the best dressed man, men in the tribes, we decided to have a style show. We're going to show you what the well-dressed cannibal will wear this year. Captain Salisbury had made a previous trip to this island, and he had a copy of Asia containing pictures of these men which he had taken. They got a great bang out of seeing their own pictures in that publication. Okay, I'm going to return to some um, further comments about Gao in the conclusion, but right now I'm going to move to Fine and Claw and the Ballad Atlas. Maps from the Middle Ages and early modern period performed a variety of discursive functions, inspiring travel, justify justifying attitudes towards self and other, and serving as religious polemics. Indeed, in some ways, they're less of a map than what Valerie Flint calls a species of morality. They were also objects of status and power, given as presents to reigning monarchs and displayed on palace walls and floors as in an early 12th century map protected by glass on the floor of Countess Adela of Bois' bedroom, upon which presumably she could walk and stand. Medieval maps evoked a sense of space and place through similar, regis similar sensual registers to cinema. And while obvious differences exist between the two, including but not limited to films, photorealism, indexicality, scale, movement, editing, and viewing protocols, the concept of choreography might be a, a way of thinking about some of these simil similarities. Derived from the writings of ancient geographers um, Pomponius Mella and Claudius Ptolemy, chorography refers to a mode of descriptive geography that archaeologist Darrell Roll describes as a representation of space or place, a cartography that in modern articulations incorporates information about specific traits of a region. Unlike geography, with its emphasis on providing exact position and size, chorography's primary concern is with painting what uh, Ptolemy called a true likeness of a place, a mimetic goal shared by expedition films and dexicality, although mimesis is obviously in tension with the geographical imagination in both. 
Chorography's methodological openness, um, what Rawls sees as the tradition's somewhat ambiguous and protean nature, serves as a conceptual bridge across expedition cinema, world atlases, and portland charts, a reminder that tropes for signifying spatial and cultural otherness have remained remarkably stable over centuries. Considered a revolutionary innovation when compared to earlier maps, Portland charts included a network of rum lines, those are those sort of geometric lines uh, crisscrossing the map, with points of the compass as well as a scale bar that assisted the measurement of distances between places. The coast served, um, contained rather, the most critical piece of information um, on a Portland chart. Although the interior of land masses were also iconographically dense, including pictorial and abstract signs, cities, topographical features, religious figures, wildlife and ethnography, and flags, uh, notoriously unreliable given the lack of standardization across maps, suggesting a tension between their status as guides for mariners sailing the Mediterranean and their function um, as chronographic introductions to a place, its people, and natural environment. For example, a 1602 um, Portland map by Italian Johannes Oliva of the Mediterranean and surrounding countries is pictographically dense with vignettes of cities with banners, figures of sovereigns, coats of arms, people, animals, trees, ships, and even a graphic representation of the cru crucifixion scene at the top of the map. Spread across the northern and western coasts of Africa are depictions of a variety of wildlife, including an elephant, lion, a camel ridden by a Tunisian man, and a unicorn. The world for which Christ paid the ultimate sacrifice is represented more in choreographic than topographical form. In other words, geograph geographic accuracy takes a back seat to an accumulative iconography of typicality, rendered as, as the strategic insertion of cities, animals, and figures across the surface of the map. Accurate scale matters less than the spatial prominence of re regional tribal leaders who, armed with weapons and shields, stand ready to defend territories, visual synecdoches of their power and status. Next, in size are the wildlife, as big or bigger than the cities, and often represented in motion. The palm trees and small clumps of vegetation sprouting next to the feet of the animals not only unify the space, but code it as a green, habitable, and capable of supporting a diverse ecosystem. Toponymic information competes with the visual for our attention. The pictorial drawing our eye away from the coastal edges towards the open spaces of the center. Oriented vertically towards the crucifixion at the top, the coastlines, coastline of the Mediterranean, Western Europe, Scandinavia, Scandinavia Africa, and the Middle East are positioned horizontally suggesting that the map or the human body must move in order to read the toponyms and view the pictographs the right way up. The visual also takes precedent over the textual in the stripped down thematic French Portland map, circa 1600, in which the animal, animals puncturing the blank space serve as curious lures. Blank spaces have always been problematic in cartography evading representation and, as Siobhan Carroll argues, quote, imagined as harboring within themselves marvelous unknowns, such as the deep sea and the inner earth, but also as resisting, because of their climate or material character, their conversions into colonizable forms of space, end quote. The projection of animal iconography into cartographic space is thus all the more enigmatic, given the copious amount of neutral space inviting conjecture about why this kind of information was deemed important for the mariner and what we can learn of a space from a handful of animals. According to Portland scholar Tony Campbell, these charts trigger an imaginative response that works in concert with the more pragmatic information about the coastline, an oscillation that arguably exists in the viewing protocols of expedition films and perhaps all documentary cinema where our imagination quixotically fills in the gaps, projecting us into the spaces of the map and the film. In some way, these thematic Portland charts are reminiscent of medieval silent maps, entirely wordless circular maps, world maps, that invited the viewer to contemplate the visual elements and reflect on its meaning. This Portland chart was likely 
was most likely made as a decorative rather than a technical object of guidance, a choreographic idea of a map as a representation or picture derived from the word sura. The Portland Charts telescoping of instrumentalized knowledge places it at the start of a long list of technologies for charting human perception of the land. A tradition that Priya Jacoma argues occurred across a wide range of professions and avocations, from cinema to medicine to exploration, militarization, and recon reconnaissance. It is to the valid atlas, however, that we must turn to find the most stunning examples of the visualization of space and people in the early modern period, a reimagining of cartography beyond the limits of toponyms and into an entirely new realm of the geographic imagination that comes closest to anticipating expedition film. An example of the Dieppe School of Cartography, the Valid Atlas was completed in 1547 and consists of 15 nautical charts drawn on 34 leaves of vellum. According to Port Portuguese historian Luis uh, Tomás, several mysteries envelop the map. Nothing is known of Nicholas Ballard, who lent his name to the atlas. It appropriates the Muslim convention of inverting north and south, a rare feature of European cartography. And most significantly for this investigation, the interior regions of continents consist almost entirely of illustrations rather than place names, ignoring even major cities close to the coast, such as Paris and London. While space precludes examining the many incredible maps of the Ballot Atlas, I will focus briefly on the pictorial vignettes on a map shown, showing Terra Java's eastern coast of Australia, a map that represents people engaged in an array of activities, activities ranging from small moments of human intimacy at the bottom of the page, in which a couple with an infant are seated beneath a tree, to what appears to be warfare at the top. The Valid Atlas redefines the uses and meanings of maps in three ways. Through the emphasis on visual rather than to toponymical information, through imagining the coastline as an opening into geoethnographic knowledge, and through an emphasis on human activities rather than uh, topographical information. The Atlas performs several discursive moves that place the observer in the field in similar ways to expedition films. There is an alliance between the two, suggestive of Giuliana Bruno's idea of a perceptual path in which, the in which the atlas beholder or film spectator encounter movement across and within space. The action on four different layers in the Australian map, let's just go back to that for a second, um, has uh, filmic analogies, either as a single shot structured across several distinct planes of action or the idea of a filmic path leading the eye along the edge of the coastline. Idiomatically in concert, films and maps are strangely coextensive, as Tom Conley persuasively argues, which is why, which is why it's easy to see how cinema and, and cartography draw on many of the same resources and virtues of the languages that inform their creation. Maps function as ge geographical pictures during the Middle Ages and early modern period invites comparison with the expedition film Fang and Claw, offering a way of thinking about and through space via animals and drawing connection to Portland charts that only use animals as inscriptional markers. Produced by the Van Buren Corporation with a voiceover narration by um, Hunter Frank Buck, easily spotted at the start of the film, um, dressed in, well there he is, actually, let's see, there he is on the right hand slide, um, dressed in colonial garb and flanked by native assistants, Fang and Claw borrows the organi organizational structure of the illustrated travel lecture. Although in lieu of new destinations during the nine month expedition to Malaysia and India, the trapping and transportation of different animals back to camp move the narration forward. There's a purity of purpose to this film, since it contains virtually every trope of the expedition film, including several sequences of jaw-dropping wonder, as when a live tiger that has been captured is lowered by rope down a sheer rock face. And at the end of the film, footage of a baby elephant, supported only by black and white ropes, being lifted and deposited on the deck of the ship. 
This closing sequence is a bizarre yet entirely fitting genouement to Fang and Claw's operational aesthetic. It's tore behind the scenes of how American zoos populate their exhibits in the Depression era. And let's just take a look at this clip, very brief. this film is unavailable. Um, it is, I saw it at the UCLA uh, Film and Television Archive and um, was unable to procure a copy to show here today, so I do apologize, and that was um, just a short clip I was able to obtain. Fang, Fang and Claw foregrounds a similar visual eclecticism um, as Portal and Charts in the Valley of Atlas, although it contains significantly less useful information about people and place than either of these other cartographic texts. The most prominent visual episteme is that of eyewitnessing, in which the privileging of the visual, what medievalist Shireen Kanmohad Mahdi sees as its explicit alignment with the gathering of cultural and natural information, um, takes precedent over the verbal. The voiceover narration even corroborates the spectator's status <coughs> as witness participant even before the film gets going visually, Buck ramps up the excitement by saying, wild jungles of Asia, it's a savage, fear, savage fierce country and we're going there now, safely guarded from the risk of danger. We're often looking down upon humans or animals from a high angle shot, uh, but nevertheless we're interpolated into the ensuing drama of animal capture. Geographical space in Fang and Claw is timeless strangely circumscribed and void of geospatial markers beyond fleeting shots of a local village under threat from a marauding tiger and reference to a long trek with animals through the jungle of Johor. Space and the animals are coterminous in the film. In fact, space becomes the animals and is only ever featured in the pursuit or transportation of wildlife. In the universe of Fang and Claw, the animal's natural environment becomes lethal for their survival because of a new type of natural predator, humans, who transform vines and branches into decoys and traps. For example, an antelope is caught by a camouflage noose, concealed bamboo fences swing around to entrap the animals in an improvised pen, and a long sought after bird of paradise, lured by the beta grasshoppers, is ensnared with bamboo spikes. In contrast, animals are shown peacefully coexisting with humans in the Valid Atlas either as domesticated horses and camels, um, lions that live in the grounds of a palace, or a sole and an elephant standing by a river. Buck also leverages the anthropomorphic framing of the animals in fang and claw as pesky and dangerous undesirables that the expedition can expel vigilante style. So crocodiles become the, quote, public enemy number one. Monkeys are constructed as welfare queens who, quote, even at the very end, thought they could get something for nothing. A captive bear called Hard Luck Harry takes on the persona of a Depression-era sidekick. And a baby rhinoceros named Lucy that is nursed back to health following a tiger attack is an adorable rescue. The film clearly anticipates the Disney-style nature documentary in which animals are anthropomorphized for dramatic and comic effect. Even the capture of a troop of monkeys is framed as a revenge narrative. We are told Buck wanted to get back at the animals for previous mis mischievous behavior, as well as um, a mass production, he calls it that, in the case of capturing monkeys, a way of maximizing the number of animals that can be captured alive in one fell swoop. Fang and Claw on the Portland maps and Valid Atlas might be considered chronographic texts in their singular insistence on defining the terms of their existence along both standard and unorthodox cartographic lines. Their telescoping in on ethnic geographical information reminds us of their shared and interesting paths of observation, of seeing space ideologically. Fang and Claw is in the resource extraction business, but also views the world of collecting as a temporary straightening out of the jungle, ridding it of some of its undesirables. The Portland charts and valid atlas are enigmatic aesthetically rich objects that hint at the space-defining possibilities 
of the expedition film long before its invention. All right, so we move to my conclusion. Exploitation expedition films rekindle a deep fascination with cultural difference, a difference often rendered in racist, ethnocentric, and sometimes historical terms. Invitations to see thrills beyond your wildest dreams or marquees such as they eat their mothers-in-law, promotional copy for Cannibal Island, invite us to look with a similar, although I know it's kind of crazy, although by no means identical mix of incredulity, fascination, and possibly guilt that our medieval ancestors did when they gazed at world atlases of monstrous peoples. Eric Schaefer's assessment of the exploitation film as a multi-dimensional experience that can, quote, arouse, thrill, entertain, and educate, and quote, its audience by leveraging the kind of libidinal appeal of taboo subjects, exotic sexual practices, and the wondrous, could as easily be a description of the looking relations offered by a wide swath of medieval cartography and Renaissance travel, Im Renaissance travel imagery featuring semi-nude women, monstrous peoples, and bizarre practices. As entrapped as these exploitation films might feel in their moments, sorry, I don't want that, in their moments of production, there's nevertheless much to be gained from situating them within a diachronic arc of images of exploration. Moments when many of the same impulses for navigating difference and curiosity about unknown places of the world become apparent. In texts from both historical periods, there are contradictions, pockets of resistance, and more complex reciprocal looking than we had hitherto realized. Returning to the methodology of choreography might offer us a way out of the exploitation film's insidious racism and hyperbolic tendencies. In looking closely at the footage in Gaon, Fang, and Claw, and the ethnographic vignettes of the Valid Atlas, we see glimpses of the natural environment, information about what people wear, hunt, and how they prepare for battle. In the case of Gao, the experience of viewing the film without the, sou the, the soundtrack dials down the exploitation almost to the point of elimination. And if we consider the fact that Salisbury paid the Islanders to reenact the cannibalism headhunting sequences, knowing full well that nothing like this had occurred in a really, really long time, a practice not atypical in early ethnographic films, we are left with the most compelling evidence yet of the role of the imagination in the construction of ethnographic texts. The marvelous has been the stock in trade of travel writing since at least the Middle Ages and resurfaces in the ballyhoo of the exploitation film. In neither instances, I would contend, should we dismiss or entirely dismiss these works on the basis of their excesses and untruths. For they reveal what um, Arthur Percival Newton calls, quote, the attitude of mind of the travelers of the time, half critical, half, half credulous, end quote. More significantly, more significantly, in terms of indigenous self-determination, they contain extraordinary images of communities making sense of their altered lives under the colonial authority of, authority of missionaries and displaying the resilience of their cultural practices. The connection to earlier moments of exploration and image making is motivated less by a, quote, look how racist Western image making has always been sensibility, although undoubtedly an element of that is inescapable, but a prizing apart of the exploitation film to uncover both its roots in earlier modes of cartographic image making and its ability to question and even dismantle its own modus operandi through reiterative readings. Discovery, exploration, exploitation, and empire have always been in close quarters, providing insight into Euro Europe's proto-capitalist development in the case of the cartography of Americas, and always revealing of what James Clifford so famously called the idea of travel as a series of encounters and translation. Artifacts left behind provide windows onto their ge geographical imagination surprisingly stable over centuries of epistemic and paradigmatic shifts in scientific, cartographic, cultural, and geopolitical knowledge. Thank you for your time. I'm a little hoarse, but I'm very happy to take questions. And Thank you very much, Alison. We have a, a bit of time for uh, questions and comments. so. Please feel free to engage. Yes. 
Thank you very much. I'm, I was thinking, and maybe I, I don't know the, the periods of, of uh, or what, I mean, what exactly they did in terms of time inside the film, because you're talking a lot about the spatial imagination. But I wondered how much of like the the salvage anthropology trope or the salvaging of anything was there. Were they were they suggesting that these that these um, tri these these exotic um, sorry whatever these practices were dying out, and this was your last chance to see them, or there was there still the idea that actually these were people on different time frames, and in a sense they're not dying out. This is how they this is how they still are. I wonder where where time played into. It. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, I think I think it's it's sort of wanting to have its cake and eat it. I mean, in some ways, there is this kind of allochronic, timeless present there, um, and yet there are hints of modernity and contact. So I think obviously the narrative when they reach the Andaman Islands is that these are people, you know, trapped in this timeless present. Um, there's certainly no. Um, Admission that you know cannibalism doesn't exist, or the head head headhunters don't um, continue to head headhunt, um, and yet you know there are definite tensions with the earlier footage in in Fiji, which is very much about sort of British colonial rule and about um, you know uh, this sense of them having become sort of evolved. So I mean I think the film kind of packs um, you know discourses of uh, this kind of evolutionary hierarchy in the second half of the film, which I think is then, uh, yeah, definitely in tension with a sort of a sense of, of um, being a kind of shared co-presence. So, you know, I mean, the uh, cloud cross sequence, I think, is a wonderful example of that kind of salvage discourse that you're mentioning, right? That, you know, there's an impracticality to these sales, and yet they persist, they persist, um, the sequence then sat, segues into a longer discussion of trading. Um, I mean, to me, you know, it, it kind of encapsulates this idea of a certain trepidation and uncertainty about what exactly um, should be told. I mean, I, I think obviously the more um, iconically exploitative films that the Johnsons did, um, I mean, I think they, they have a very clear sense of of what kind of narrative they're telling in terms of the Johnsons as these emblems of a very you know extreme white Euro American kind of privilege, um, whereas you know I, I think Gal the Headhunter um, I think there's kind of more to recuperate from this film and I and I and it's available in five parts on YouTube if you want to assemble it all um, and I urge you to watch it without the soundtrack. Um, because it is a very, very different experience. Um, and if you listen to the bonus features, you'll get a wonderful sense of just how much, uh, how much of it was staged and reenacted, which of course goes on all the time in ethnographic films. Um, so yeah, those are just some thoughts on that question. Hi. Oh, Thank yeah. you so much. Um, that was really, really interesting. I think that something that I was thinking about a lot as you were talking um, was this, the, the, the relation, like the way that the viewer's relationship to truth is shifted from like the era of like the, the, the map making in the Middle Ages to um, these like 20th century documentary films in some way. Um, and like that how like the expectation of truth and what truth and representation really means is like really significant and like how we can think about um, what what these are doing and what the, what what makes them like compelling and different. So I was wondering if you had any reflections mm. on like this. And I'm thinking particularly of this really great book that's someone old now called uh, by Chopin called a um, a social history of truth. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of is addressing like that that moment of that shift. So thank you. Right. So. I think unpacking truth in relation to these many of old texts is obviously very, very complicated. Um, I mean, what I was, I think, trying to hint at is that I think there are recuperative potentials and, and kind of tensions around veracity, um, absolute monstrous kind of fictional imagining of extreme difference um, that I think um, 
one has to kind of look at sort of traces of, of how these maps were understood and, and how notions of otherness, which of course are, are you know, very different to our notions. Um, and yet, I guess what I'm trying to do here is, is sort of a trace, a true, a sort of trace a, a through line, I guess, of the role of the imagination as being the kind of counter side of truth, right? I mean, you know, I guess you begin to believe when, you know, you hit this, this, this moment when truth kind of sits with you or truth kind of sort of emerges, right? And I mean, I haven't traced a kind of intellectual history of truth. I mean, I think I'll definitely think about that book you've mentioned and think about the question. Um, and I had something else to say about this, and I'm trying to collect my thoughts here. Um, right, in relation to the exploitation films, um, I think that there's this kind of questioning of whether what you see is actually going on throughout the film, right? And um, the more hyperbolic the narration becomes, the more I think you begin to question whether much of this, um, I wouldn't say is actually untrue, but you know, in other words, what isn't shot, what isn't shown in all of these sequences, I think is, is, is as interesting as what is shown. Um, and of course, the film is this hodgepodge of various different moments from the expedition. So the entire iteration of whichever version of this film you look at is, is in many ways a kind of a discourse of this notion of like untruth in some ways, right? Because what is it possibly attempting to do? Um, and I mean, I, you know, I, I really like the term the geographic imagination because I think it really does encapsulate this dialectic between um, whether we can kind of believe in the veracity of the image um, and whether we also hold on to the idea of it as this construction. I mean, the Valid Atlas, I think, in many ways, um, is, is an invitation into this kind of tension between whether, you know, like how useful is that knowledge? Um, why is it within a map? Like, like why isn't it just a separate image? Like what, how, what role does the map play? ensuring up the veracity of this image, right? Like that coastline is so significant because it's the invitation to, I think, a certain notion of, of geographic truth, right? Um, so, um, you know, I think, I think the kind of referencing of maps in the exploitation, well, in, in all expedition films, I mean, it's a really recurring truth, I think is a kind of a recalibration of truth, right? It's like, well, here's the map, like, here we are, here's where we're heading. And then once the map disappears, you then, I think, you know, fall into the ex expedition film, ethnographic films, you know, kind of, um, struggle to kind of manage its, 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 value as an indexical truth document and its constant um, stripping away of, of any kind of profilmic reality, right? In other words, these, 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 these are just fragments of knowledge. I mean, I really love that quote, that all these encounters are just fragments of knowledge. It's bits of visual information that's put together, um, Kind of structured by some 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 narrative of, of why we're here and where we're going and what we'll know at the end, um, and I mean in many ways you know maybe we just throw truth out you know I mean truth I mean how you know but I mean truth is there in the discourse you know like that producer's note has quality of truth to it right we believe because it's a producer's note right <laughs> producer's not going to lie to us and it's BS right I mean they. they there aren't, there aren't, they're not using telescopes. They're never in danger. I mean, all of this is complete nonsense. Um, but at the time, and I, and I mean, one last thing I'll say before I stop on this. I mean, I, I think that that knowingness, that wink at the audience, is there in that marquee display. They eat their mothers in law. You know, I mean, really, even in the early 30s, I, I you know, I, I, I think that there's, there's, a, there's a Barnum-esque, um, winking at the audience that, that, that this is something that um, is going to be exaggerated. But at the same time, you know, th this film is, is deeply offensive, 
Um, and the question is, I mean, how we how we kind of tease out what we do with it now, um, what it meant at the time, and um, how it how it kind of locks into this thing called the expedition film. I mean, how it sort of sits there. I can just follow up on that. Uh, I find it really fascinating in this last slide that you're showing that on the one hand, the film is uh, being presented as 100% authentic mm. and not a Hollywood production, like that's a highlighted yes, thing, right? <laughs> on the other hand, you can clearly see that that film goes into distribution in cinemas. Right. It's a commercial product and it's aimed at basically you know collecting a box office right? right it's not the same type of films that would kind of feature itself primarily as uh you know an educational film right. for right. you know a specialized audience or a kind of ethnographic film that um, sticks to certain scientific right. standards of the time um, so i'm wondering whether um, on the one hand uh, you think that the commercial um, logic uh, does something to the to the expedition films, mm -hmm. and if we can see different types of geographic imaginations in in different right. types of um, kind of uh, travel endeavors, and also you know how far back can we trace that that type of logic, which tries to also commercialize the exotic. Uh, right. You know, do we see it already in the uh, in the medieval context? Would you would you right. go as far as as that? Right. Um, Thank you for this. Uh, these are all really, really wonderful questions. Um, well, to, s to start with the first part of your question, I mean, I think it is, it is very interesting that the film is defining itself in relation to what it's not. In other words, it's, it's leveraging notions of authenticity from nonfiction cinema. Um, it's obviously using that to kind of identify itself as something that is not a studio production, right? That there's that there's location shooting, um, that you know, and it's. I mean, there's also this kind of very specific historical moment being significant signified here, where our boys are fighting. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, on on the one hand, you know. Ethnographic films can can take on more or less commercial feelings depending on where they're they're shown, right? I mean, if you show if this film could have been shown at a museum of natural history, um, a scientific organization, it could have been shown at the National Geographic Society, and and its and its kind of scientificness might have been sort of brought out, and and yet it's there in an LA theater um, being shown commercially. So, I mean, I think in some ways. Um, you know, this is the heyday of the kind of exotic commercial ethnographic film. So people are aware of, I think, what's going on here, right? I mean, it, it doesn't start with the Nuke of the North. It starts much earlier with, you know, some of the teen Carl Akeley animal adventure films. So I think audiences at the time had a set of reference that they were drawing upon in making sense of this. Um, I mean, in some ways, I think it, 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 the fact that it is in com widespread commercial release, I mean, I, I, I think it sort of authenticates it in terms of um, it has a significant budget, that it's a film that's, you know, not someone's home movie footage, that it has a kind of production value, that it will have a standard that audiences will expect, um, and that it has, a, I guess, a sort of a marker of, of quality, right? So I think it, it's kind of shoring up the truth value, but it's, it's also giving a kind of a gloss to it. Um, but, but at the same time, I think that um, I think this this film could easily have found its way into educational circuits. I mean, I haven't been able to just sort of track its its uses. Um, you know, it, it I think by the fifties, clearly it's it's fallen into the sort of exploitation genre category, and it's seen as you know sort of a classic of its sort. I mean, Eric Schaefer writes about it. Um, in terms of tracing back that notion of, I guess, a popular appeal to these images. I mean, of course, there's the through line that goes back through World's Fairs and 19th century photography and ethnographic displays. Um, and I think in some ways, you know, 
the connection with the Portland maps is, I think, very pertinent because a lot of these maps were not designed as pragmatic maps. I mean, you know, even though this is a journey um, through these islands and you get these snapshots, this, this, this is not a collecting expedition. They're not really bringing anything back. There's no real furthering of ethnographic or anthropological knowledge here. There are no scientists in this expedition, right? I mean, it's just sort of using the word expedition to kind of borrow some legitimacy. Um, the same with Fang and Claw. I mean, it's a collecting expedition. But I mean, what does the word expedition really mean? Um, and how, you know, how is it being used to kind of evoke some kind of sense of authority or some sense of kind of institutional value? Um, you know, these beautiful Portland maps were, were, were not, you know, were not widely available. Um, and yet, we do have a sense of them as being objects for public display. Um, so, for example, I mean, I saw uh, 20 to 30 of them at the Huntington Library, where the, valid, the original Ballad Atlas is housed. And what's really fascinating about them is that you have to walk around them to really understand them. I mean, um, you know, the sense of moving around a space, I think, is really interesting. So there's this kind of immersive, almost kind of interactive feel to them um, that I think differentiates them from other kinds of objects. Um, I don't think, you know, obviously the word commercial is <laughs> a bit tricky to use in my particular period, but the sense of them being um, triggering a kind of a sensual kind of you know, pleasure or dis displeasure. I mean, I think d pleasure and displeasure are always intention, I think, in expedition films. Um, I mean, even at a time when this, the killing of animals was perceived quite differently than it is today, um, I would say that, that there are certain kind of trans-historical, in many ways, sort of human reactions to the treatment of animals. Um, and so, you know, what struck me about Fang and Claw was that it's, it's, it's just this non-stop um, entrapment and, I mean, none of the animals are killed, but the animals are, you know, clearly suffering and stressed. Um, and so I really wanted to kind of think about um, ways of kind of connecting representations of space. So I'm, yeah, thank you for your question. It's interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much for your wonderful uh, lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is about movement and the body. Um, and I was wondering, um, particularly if, because if we extend the kind of then experiments with immersion further into the future, we get right like 3D and IMAX, and now today these kind of virtual reality anthropological mm -hmm. or ethnographic film projects. And I was fascinated by what you were saying about needing to move around the map and the kind of yeah. movement of the eye that is um, instigated by these types of maps and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on the connection between or whether there is a connection between the desire to master space and territory and geography and the impetus to master one's body mm. and how that might be uh, uh, related to us in these earlier films with the focus on then the ethnographic others bodies and how they're moving and what activities they're involved in in relation to the explorer's body mm. and whether this creates a kind of training or bodily disciplining mm. of the viewer um, of how to be like a proper Western or modern citizen. Mm. Thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big great. question. <laughs> yeah, a really great question. Um, so, um, I mean, I think let's start with kind of movement and the body. Um, you know, expedition films are, are about bodies in motion, right? I mean, they're, they're, some of the really big ones are like these monuments in motion, right? And those photographs of just these specks of people moving through these landscapes are extraordinary. And there is this kind of militaristic kind of discipline to this notion of all these bodies knowing what their jobs are and knowing how to move through through space. So I think metaphorically, I, I mean, I'm just thinking of all the expedition films in my different chapters. I would say that, you know, this this notion of, of a kind of a collective body 
that is, I mean, often leaving a trail of garbage behind it, you know, dead animals, stuff they have to get rid of. So, you know, so, so there's that kind of notion of the expedition as a metaphor for this dis disciplined body. Um, to extend it to this idea of, um, you know, contemporary experiences of our body, say, thinking about the expedition film in VR. I mean, I was telling Oksana earlier, I'm, I'm very interested in, in sort of ending this book by reflecting on what VR might hope to offer us or um, posit in terms of new experiences of space and body and encounters with other people and travel. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the work that's been done in the States on VR and social justice. Um, and the idea of being able to use VR to kind of prize open, you know, the kind of very rawness of human experience. Um, I need to experience more ethnographic and expedition VR films. I mean, the ones that I have experienced, I think, um, I've been troubled by. I mean, I, I think there's a kind of fetishizing of this notion of the encounter. Um, and I think putting people in other worlds um, might trigger emotions that we're not entirely sure about. Um, I think it raises really interesting ethical questions for the VR designer in terms of where you want to put your people um, and what 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 you know what you want them to think about. I mean, it, it's similar to showing a film, but I think that there's kind of some added um, corporeal dimensions and discourses and, and sensations that I think we're not entirely clear about. Um, I think there's also a lot of, um, you know, perhaps over expectation. I mean, VR is constantly in, in a state of becoming, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're no, not, no closer now, really, than we were in the 90s in terms of what are we going to use it for? What is it use, useful for? Um, and, I, you know, I, I get a little queasy when I think about um, its kind of throw ride connotations in relation to travel, but then again, you know, travel is, is a thrill ride, and as I've argued, wonder and sensation and the marvelous, so maybe VR is precisely the next part, you know, so it's all these marvelous maps from the Middle Ages, it's exploitation films, and then maybe it's VR, so, you know, can VR create a sensitive footprint, a sensitive, you know, um, is there such a thing as a kind of a sensitive encounter? I mean, I, I certainly think there is, um, and I, I you know, I've, I don't know whether you guys know, there's a, a great um, Canadian-based um, Felix and I can't remember the, the second name of the company, but they've done three little eight-minute um, ethnographic films with the Maasai people in Africa, um, with Mongolian uh, tribal men, and with um, uh, people that are called Sea Gypsies, the people off the coast of, coast of Borneo. Um, and uh, they were shown at the Margaret Mead uh, several years ago, and and you know they're very interesting, but I think they're um, also problematic. Um, I think there's a yeah. I, I think there's th I think we need to be using the same kind of critical vocabulary that we've used to make sense of ethnographic film and doc doc documentary film in relation to VR. Um, last point you made about mastering one's own body, um, which I'm intrigued by, um, because, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking I know what you mean, but I'm not entirely sure of what mastering one's body means literally. I mean, um, I can see certain metaphorical, and I'm assuming you kind of mean it in a sort of a metaphorical in some ways or not? I mean, what do you mean? I think, um, I mean, I, I've been thinking a lot about how increasingly in these VR experiences, there's also navigating with built sets. So like uh, the Alejandro Nyari 2 piece that was at Lapman and toured around and won a special Oscar, you had to like take your shoes off and you were in the gallery space and you walked through, like mm -hmm. as you were in the VR, mm -hmm. you were hit with mm -hmm. all these different stimuli. And okay. um, and there was another piece that was, uh, so I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Southern California, mm. and I'm here doing field work right mm. now. 
um, and I actually work with Priya, so it's like oh, nice great. To, yeah, yeah, see her work um, in your lecture. But um, there was a, a piece demoed at USC called Hero that was deeply problematic um, for me, mm -hmm. uh, in which you were placed into an unnamed, presumably Syrian village uh, moments before mm -hmm. an air raid. And there's a belt oh, I've, set. I've heard about this piece. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there's a lot of physical stimuli, and you have to walk around the space and I decide see. what you're going to do. Okay. And so I, that the, yeah. both those projects, to me, in a way, mm -hmm. um, are about quite literally disciplining yes. the viewer's okay. body and creating a particular type of humanitarian mm -hmm. ideal citizen. But mm -hmm. what I've been trying to think through in, in my writing, and we can also talk about this maybe mm -hmm. later if you have time, but is whether or not we can link this back to earlier experiments mm -hmm. with immersion or with mm -hmm. bodily kind of haptic tendencies in cinema. And so with these ex expedition films, because the people who are going out and doing the expeditions, they right. are, their bodies are being disciplined in, sure. a, in a particular way. And I'm wondering to what extent there is some kind of training or educational or something mm -hmm. quality that's then given back to viewers about how you should be carrying your body or how you if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then so I was thinking when you were talking about you have to walk around these maps to fully mm -hmm. understand them, the Valerie Atlas, that, mm -hmm. that you are asked to be in motion in a particular way. Right. And I think, I mean, right. So now, right. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think what's really incredibly rich about so many of these um, objects and images that I'm working with is that there is a very powerful kind of interactive quality to them. Um, I mean, these are sometimes used as kind of semi-devotional objects. Um, they're objects that, um, like I've been looking at books of hours where people would customize them, they paste in pages. Um, and I have a, a, another book project which is actually about the digital imaginary in medieval artifacts. Um, and so I'm very, I mean visual, visual medieval artworks. So I'm very interested in sort of bodily devotional practices that I think in many ways anticipate how we interact with objects today. Um, I mean, monks would carry their little prayer books just like people put their iPhones on their belt pockets and, you know, would be constantly taking their prayer book out, consulting, putting it back, putting it back. And while I'm very conscious of making glib analogies, see, that's just like an iPhone. Um, I do think that there's, there's this kind of explosion of the visual at this time and that images have a kind of a potency and a potential to affect people in, I think, really uncannily similar ways to today. Um, I think the early cinema period was another period with this explosion of the visual, and people trying to make sense of like, whoa, there's a train coming towards me. You know, not that they thought it was real, but just this kind of re recalibration of their visual haptic senses in relation to these images. And I think that's a really exciting, and I mean, I'm not a medieval medievalist, but a lot of many visual people, I think, are talking about these images in this way. Um, what it makes me think about in relation to some of these expedition films, I mean, in, in a, like, what, what's often absent in some of these films is someone to identify with, right? I mean, even though you know that these films are kind of authored by the expedition leaders, the expedition leaders are often not on film. So they're these kind of absent presences in these expeditions. And so um, you're kind of learning to sort of insert your body into these spaces and kind of imagine like what might it be like to now be riding the donkey or what is it like now to be riding a yak going through this particular space so I think um, I think you're, you're you know glad that this is not you but I think that, that, that there is this sense of these people taking on enormous risk bodily risk um, and I mean that sense of identification with adventure I think is certainly um, very, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's very exciting and kind of also mind-blowing, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we had a wonderful, uh, productive discussion, even in this uh, chamber audience, and I hope that uh, Vienna uh, campus also could follow this. I would like to thank you very, very, very much for this uh, wonderful presentation and the follow-up discussion, and I would like to invite everyone to continue this conversation over a little reception outdoors. Thank you very much. Right, thank you all.